Okay, um, so this is Dr. Morton. Uh, this is the Micro One uh, lecture for today, uh, the 1st of December. So here we are in December. We have one more class after this one on Thursday. On Thursday, I will do a live review. So I promise to do that. Um, and we'll see how that works. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm going to do this. Hopefully, uh, uh, I'm going to review for the exam, and I'm going to go through the these slides that are basically review for the whole thing, and then I'll then I'll look at the uh, look at the final. I already have the final. It's a hundred questions, uh, multiple answer, true, false, n a few simple numeric answers, uh, that sort of thing, and um, so I think you know it, it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, it's a little bit on the long side because it's a hundred questions. But um, but it, it it I think it counts for uh, something like twenty percent twenty four percent or something of the grade, but um, yeah well, I'll 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 definitely uh, I'll definitely uh, uh, curve it a little bit uh, so uh, <clears throat> as long as you don't miss you know seventy five of the questions you'll be fine if you get at least fifty sixty percent you'll be fine um, all right. I anticipate most people will miss a good number of them. Uh, not because I made them tricky or hard, but it's just that, uh, I don't know, engineers don't tend to do well on these kind of tests. Uh, all right, so anyway, you can see, uh, so the cur currently the final is scheduled for the 8th. It says 1 to 250, that's the time, but I'll make it available all day. Uh, and uh, you'll have two hours to do it. So that's 120 minutes for 100 questions. So, so you should time yourself. You should give yourself about 60 seconds a question. And don't spend more than that. Don't get bogged down. If you don't know something, it's only one point. So push on. Uh, if you get 80 or 90, you'll be fine. Uh, and if you, did, if you did all your labs and you did your final project, then you've got, you know, you have 50% of your course grade. So, you, you know, so you're in pretty good shape. All right, uh, and then I'll look at the programming test, the written test one, and uh, did we do written test two? I can't remember. Uh, so, and the homework grade. So there's a lot of grades for that remaining 50%, but the lab and the pro labs and project are 50% of your grade. All right, that being said, let's uh, let's push on here. Okay, so here the here are the slides. We'll do this. I'm all right. I'll move myself out of the way here. Okay, that should be good. All right. So um, yeah. So there's well, this is for, there's only uh, two yeah two lectures left. One lecture after this one. So we'll cover the pick. Uh, I'll cover the assembly a little bit. I'll cover the KL25Z a little bit, uh, so I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna spend much time on this. We we you didn't get to use it, but we did talk about it in lab. You should have a little bit of a rough idea of the differences between the KL25Z and the PIC. The KL25Z uh, is a 32-bit processor. The PIC is an 8-bit processor. The KL25Z has 128 bytes of flash, uh, 128k bytes of flash. Uh, the PIC has uh, 8k bytes. So uh, this is a much more capable chip, even though it's kind of the lower end of chip in the uh, in the KL25Z line. Well, in the KL25Z line, it's it's uh, a bigger it's one of the bigger chips, but uh, there are definitely uh, this is an M0 plus processor. There are M M I think there's M3s, M4s, M maybe M6s. So there's there's chips that are much bigger, much fat, you know, a little bit faster uh, and much more capable than this one. We'll talk about per the peripheral modules primarily on the PIC. We'll talk a little bit about C. We'll talk about some of the interfacing considerations with GPIO pins, push buttons, um, I2C, SPI, UART, um, just uh, parallel interfaces, just a whole bunch of things. And then we'll talk a little bit about just trends in, in embedded design, trends in um, mobile devices, uh, and some other considerations. All right. So uh, 
you should know the basic structure of the pick. You should know that it, it has uh, one uh, one k of random access memory and eight k of uh, program memory. You should know uh, some of the modules that are available. You don't have to memorize all of them, uh, but you should definitely know that there are uh, A to D, D to A comparators uh, on the analog side and touch buttons. Uh, you should know that the A to D is 10 bits, that the DDA, the DDA is uh, 5 bits, um, that the comparator is, uh, well, we haven't really used it, uh, so I, I, I don't think I have any questions about the comparator. Um, you should know that, uh, that it's a 20-pin chip, um, two pins for power and ground, one pin for the master clear. The programmer then uses uh, A0 and A1 as the uh, clock and data pins for, for programming it and also for debug work. So those pins are really not available. So by the time you take away uh, power, ground, master clear, and A0 and A1, that is uh, five pins. So there's 15, 15 GPIO pins left. They're divided up into ports A, B, and C. Port A has uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Port B has uh, has 4, 5, 6, and 7, and port C has 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, the pounding you hear is they're working on my roof and putting on a new roof. Right now they're taking off the old one, and it's partially driving me crazy. Um, okay. Okay, so the you should know... Um, the how the addressing scheme works for the for the pick, um, you should you should remember that um, that there's a difference between uh, program and data memory because it is a Harvard type machine, and uh, what you should remember is, is that the uh, program is in a 14-bit wide uh, flash memory that has its own separate address line and data lines. The data lines are 14 bit wide for the 14 bits wide for the memory, for the program memory, because all, all the instructions are 14 bits wide. And uh, the address bus is 15 bits because it can have up to 32K of uh, memory. So uh, the data memory, the, the data bus for that is 8 bits because everything there is 8 bits wide. And uh, the special function registers are, are 8 bits maximum. And all the all the random access memory locations are eight bits, and uh, the address bus there is only twelve bits uh, in this chip, uh, and uh, and that that those addresses include essentially thirty two banks, uh, and starting in bank zero, uh, the memory uh, every bank has in the lower banks uh, has the special function registers. Well, the core registers are mapped to every bank. And then uh, that's the first 13. And then above that, uh, you have the special function registers. And, and then starting, starting usually at hex 20 in every bank, you have uh, random access memory up until where you, you get the 1K, which is it goes roughly up to, I think, bank 12. It has the last bank with any memory in it. And after that, then really there's, uh, and I don't think there's any special function registers past that either. So basically it's, most of the special function registers in the first few banks. And then uh, you do have the, the upper 16 random access memory locations in bank zero are mapped to every bank. Uh, and the uh, lower, uh, the core registers, which I think are 13 uh, registers, are in every, uh, mapped to every bank as well. Okay, so uh, you should know the programmer's model for the, uh, for the PIC. Uh, and, uh, and again, that it is Harvard architecture. The KL25Z is, is a von Neumann, which is really Princeton architecture. Sepp von Neumann named it after himself. And, uh, and then you should have a little bit of, of an idea of some of the electrical characteristics, the operating voltage, uh, the amount of current the, the pins can sink, and, the GPIO pins can sink and source, things like that. You don't have to memorize any of the other characteristics, but you should, you should have kind of general knowledge. Of, of, of ballpark figures, uh, but I'm not going to ask a lot of detailed questions about that. Um, in fact, I don't think there are any that ask about, I don't even think I ask about the 25 milliamps. Um, so um, you should know 
you should know a little bit about the clock module. You should know that you can have external crystals, resonators, or uh, RC circuits, uh, and the and the chip will support them and and uh, and provide the stimulation for those crystals and resonators uh, as long as you put in the proper capacitors and whatnot. You should know that it has an internal uh, clock source that it's got a couple of fixed clocks and then it, it can generate using a phase lock loop a number of additional clocks and it can its maximum clock speed is 32 megahertz that the system clock operates uh, it has to tick four times for each instruction so you're you're we normally use this abbreviation FOS divided by four and that's the instruction clock so we run our we have typically set the clock at uh, four megahertz and then that means that it executes an instruction every uh, one microsecond, a hundred at, at one megahertz rates, or a million instructions a second. Um, so let's see. Um, there are uh, there are a number of uh, of. Um, other features like the watchdog. Um, the uh, these are also most of these are also available on the KL25Z. On the KL25Z, they call it a, a COP computer operating properly instead of a watchdog. And then you do have the ability to uh, to protect uh, your code and data from reverse engineering. Uh, you do have to configure configuration words uh, on on the uh, PIC chip. Yeah, the pounding is just ridiculous. Okay, so, and then uh, you don't really have to set configuration words on the uh, KL25Z. And then uh, the PIC does have a basic interrupts, uh, whereas the KL25Z has a more advanced set of interrupts. So you should definitely be aware of all the modules we use in lab, the GPIO, touch sensing, a to D, timers, PWM, UART, and I squared C. Uh, there, there, uh, let's see, and I should, I should add that to this. So, uh, and I see too. So, so you should definitely be aware of these. We'll talk about these. Uh, and I'll, I may finish up a little bit on, on Monday, I mean, on Wednesday. So you should know um, <clears throat> the general instruction structure all 14 bits, opcodes and operands, you should know uh, how we have uh, the label, then the opcode, then the operands, and then comments. Uh, for the pick, we can have one or two operands, that's it, uh, in in the uh, assembly language. Uh, you, should, you should remember a little bit, although I actually don't think there's any, I don't think there's any uh, I don't think there's any assembly language um, questions on the test at all. Um, you should know, let's see, I'll put this back up. Oh, where is my thing? There it is. So you should know how to, uh, you should know how the, how, the, how the address in an instruction works. And for the instructions that are byte oriented or almost any of the instructions that reference a special function register or a random access memory location, Seven bits of the address of the 12-bit address are embedded in the instruction in that 14 bits, and five bits are in the bank select register, uh, which is uh, yeah the bank select register. We set the bank select register up with the bank cell instruction, which creates a move literal to W. Uh, sorry, move literal to B instruction. And since the bank register is only five bits, the literal can only be five bits in size. So 0 through 31. Um, and that's how we address all of the data memory, which includes the special function registers and uh, the core registers and all the random access memory locations. Um, you should understand how interrupts work and how, what you have to do to write an interrupt routine. In assembly, we just have to put it at location 4. But you have to remember that you can't, you don't get to, the only glo the only variables that can communicate with other parts of the of the program are global variables. But normally in the interrupts, we typically will use 
We might use a global variable to, to read in something and store it for the main routine to go back and deal with it at some, some point. But normally we use local variables that come into existence and go out of existence once the uh, interrupt routine is finished. Um, all right, and you should know a, a, a few of the compiler directives, like, like how we establish the origin with org, uh, how we use define statements, include statements, um, and other things, and the, how we do the configuration words. They're very similar in MPASM as they are in C, but the syntax is a little different. You don't have to memorize the syntax. That's not necessary. You just have to know that you have to do them in both languages. Um, so on the KL25Z, uh, you, I, I, I'm not going to ask you uh, specifics, but you ought to know that it has a fair amount of flash. Uh, it turns out 128K. You should know that it's got a little more. It's got 8K of uh, uh, static RAM. I think that's right. Maybe it's... Well, now I, I have to go look it up. I think it's 8K. Uh, you should know about the... You, I, I'm not gonna. I don't think there's any questions about the details of the programmer's model, but you should know in general that there that there are 13 general pur, uh, that there are 13 general purpose registers, eight lower ones and five upper ones. The five upper ones are not available to all the instructions. Only the lower eight are available to all instructions, and that uh, most of the addressing done in the KL25Z is. Uh, is based on uh, it's 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 indirect addressing using registers. Okay, you should know that everything in the K in the in the KL25Z is mapped into the 32-bit uh, address space, so four gigabytes. And you should know that the chip runs at 3.3 volts. Uh, I think it can run at 1.8 to 3.3 actually. You should know that. Uh, it can get down to very, very low power states because it, you, it allows you to turn off clocks to most of the modules and it, it even the, the, all the ports. You, you should know that it's an 80-pin chip and that there, uh, there's A, B, C, D, and E ports uh, available. So it's got a lot more pins than, than uh, the 16F1829, and that's fine. Um, you should know that it has direct memory access which means that a peripheral can uh, can uh, initiate a write from the peripheral to uh, memory all on its own. Doesn't have to have uh, the CPU involved at all. CPU can be doing other things. Um, all right, and you should also know that uh, just a little bit about how to how to. Well, I, I'm not going to ask you any details about programming it because we didn't really do that. Um, okay. Uh, so you should know. Uh, so you should know the peripheral modules I mentioned. If you, uh, I think that's about all I'm going to ask you about. I don't think I. I no, I did ask about some external devices. I asked about potentiometers. I asked about uh, the two line by sixteen LCD display. You should know about those. Uh, and I also. Uh, and, and a, a little bit about the, the UART and the temperature sensor. You should know the temperature sensor puts out a voltage proportional temperature and that you have to A to D that in. Um, you should know that you have to A to D in the pot reading too. Uh, and then it reads from ground to VDD. Um, and I forget what else. Those are main things. Um, oh, and you should know, also know about the photoresistor. And how we set it up with a with a resistor. So the photoresistor and a 5K resistor are go from ground to VDD, and you're reading it where the where the photoresistor and the 5K resistor are joined. So that when the 5K resistor uh, is uh, has a very high resistance because it's dark, then uh, it'll shift towards uh, towards what the 5K resistor is connected to, and then when the when the photoresistor is, when it's light, and the photoresistor gets down to maybe uh, something like four or five uh, uh, kilo ohms, uh, then you then the uh, the common point will be about halfway in between VDD and VSS, and you can uh, use your A to D to set a threshold and and pick up that difference in light. Um, you should definitely know. Uh, that uh, 
some of the serial protocols, UART, and how we use the, the TTL level UART to the USB signals using the, uh, the, C, the CP2102 dongle. You should know about I2C because we use it with the uh, two line by 16 LCD display. Uh, I talked about SPI. Uh, I may not ask you, there may be one question about SPI or maybe none. Uh, you should know a little bit about the difference that SPI is faster than I2C typically, that uh, I2C uses two lines, but SPI uses a minimum of, uh, of, of three lines and maybe four because there might be might have to use a, say, a slave select. And then when you add additional SPI modules, uh, you do have to add additional slave select lines. Whereas with the I2C, it only uses two wires and you can add up to, well, theoretically, 127 uh, peripheral devices onto it. Uh, but realistically, you can't get that many and it, they won't work and, and they all have assigned addresses and some of them would probably overlap that would cause problems. Um, the I2C is definitely slower than the SPI. Um, SPI can run pretty fast. Okay, um, so uh, in let's yeah, you should know you should know how to set a switch up as an input to a GPIO port. You you should know that that if the switch is like a push button, then where it's uh, it's normally open, and then when you push it, it closes the switch. So you want to make sure you put a pull up on the GPIO port or a pull down, and then and then the push button would pull it the other way. So you would put like a 10K to a VDD, and then the push button would connect the uh, pin to ground. And that way, when you push the button, it reads zero. When you let off the button uh, and it's open, then the pull-up pulls it up to VDD or a one. And that's how our switch is implemented. It's a one when it's not pushed. It's a zero when it is pushed. Um, you should... We... We skipped the lab on using the uh, bi bi bipolar junction transistor as a switch, but it's uh, but we talked about it, and you should just know uh, kind of how we do that. Um, I don't think I ask any real detailed questions about it, though. Um, you should know that if you're going to use higher voltages, then you can use a BJT. You can use a FET. You can also use a, uh, a solid-state uh, uh, relay. And you could use a regular relay, although regular relays do have a downside to them. Uh, they, when, when the micro energizes the coil of a relay, the relay has got to be designed so it can, can be energized with very low current. And um, hopefully uh, you probably still need a diode so that the, uh, the voltage spike generated when you close and open a coil uh, doesn't uh, do damage to the microprocessor. Um, let's see, did I do that? Yeah, no. Um, all right, and you should know just that some of the larger inductive loads, like uh, big motors, they're typical, uh, typically a lot of things you need to do to protect your micro from them. Normally, you, you probably want to run these with much higher voltage anyway, so you're going to have to use an optical isolator, and, uh, and that's usually built into a, to an H-bridge that you can drive with the micro, and then you can provide uh, power to it that can be, you know, 35 volts or 25 volts or something like that, 12 volts, whatever. So uh, we we did our programming. Micro, the microchip uh, environment only supports part of the C++. Uh, it's it doesn't support it all. Doesn't even support all of C. Uh, but you can program it either way. We focus mainly on C, uh, but there's not that much difference uh, it's more um, it's more some of the things like uh, classes and inheritance that uh, that really distinguish them uh, object oriented nature you should know a little bit about how you need to, to structure your program you have you have some setup uh, stuff which includes configurations and your include files and defines and then uh, global variables and function prototypes and then you have um, your main module, and then you, or your interrupt module, then your main module, and then you have, um, after that, you may have some uh, functions that are defined. Again, you don't define functions inside another function. They're always defined outside of main. Um, and, and if you define them after main, then they have to have a function prototype uh, because it's a one-pass compiler. Um, 
All right. So anyway, um, you should know uh, about some of the operators in C. Uh, it's not going to be a test on C, and there there's very few questions about C, so you don't really have to worry too much. But you should just review your C so you, you remember basic things. You should know for, while, do, while, your your case and uh, conditional uh, ifs, if, else, ifs, and uh, else's. Um, you should. Uh, you should know just a little bit about pointers and arrays. You need to know that, that the array name without a subscript is a pointer, that you can assign the uh, array address to a pointer, and then you can reference the array through the pointer. Uh, you should know that the array name is a pointer constant, so you're not allowed to change it, uh, but it is a pointer. Uh, but you can't increment it and that sort of thing like you can another pointer. But you can, yeah. Uh, and you know a little bit about... Uh, about interrupts. Okay, I think think that's it. Um, all right, so I think I'm gonna. Let's see. So maybe I will. Uh, let me let me get rid of that. Um, let's see. Um, so I might go just a little bit longer here, but I need to stop. Um, need to stop soon. So I might go another seven minutes here. All right, so let me pause it for a second. Okay, I think what I'll do now is I'm just going to kind of, here, I'll expand this a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to kind of look at the test without showing you the test because I, um, yeah. Uh, but what I'll do, I'll just go through this real quick. and I'll, So, so... I do want you to know the advantage of touchpads over switches. Uh, you should know what pins the SNAP programmer uses. Uh, you, you should know uh, that uh, a little bit about the Viva board, like the push button can be a reset or an input, uh, that you can jumper 5 volts or 3.3 volts. I mean, you guys should probably know all that stuff anyway. Uh, why we use bypass capacitors, basically, uh, obviously, we, we, we're trying to prevent voltage dips, switching noise. We're trying to filter out high frequency noise uh, from nearby digital equipment. Um, you should know that the, the RBG LED, whether it has a common cathode or a common anode, and why that changes whether or not you have to, uh, you have to uh, use a one or a zero to turn it on and off. Obviously, if it has a common cathode, then all the, uh, one side of all the LEDs. Uh, let's see. Let me fix this real quick. Uh, oh, crap! Where's the right one? So my green one is. There we go. Okay. Oh, that wasn't what I wanted. Okay, oh, well, we'll just put it over there. That'll work. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that makes it so it's not as not as hard to see. It's a little, oh, yeah, kind of blind here. All right. So, um, so you should know that if you have a common cathode, then the pin has to be a 1 on the other side of the LED to turn it on. If you have a common anode, then the pin has to be 0 because one side of the LED is already hooked to the positive voltage. So uh, you should draw that out and just convince yourself you understand that. Um, you should know that the pick can be run from uh, from something like 1.8 to 5.5 volts or something like that, and that uh, that the, uh, the KL25Z does have a stack pointer register where you can put, uh, it's an indirect address essentially, you, so you can assign the stack pointer wherever you want in random, a, random access memory. Um, actually, I guess you could assign it anywhere, but it won't work in anything but random access memory. But you could, uh, in, the, in, the, in the PIC, at least in our mid-level PIC, it, it only has a 16-level hardware register and you can't reassign it. You're, you just have 16 levels, period. Whereas in the KL25Z, you put it in RAM and you can you obviously that if you're using RAM for other things, there's a point where uh, 
you could run into your variables. Normally you put your variables in low memory and you start the uh, stack at the very highest memory location. So the stack decrements down into memory and <clears throat> as you add variables you build up into memory and as long as they don't meet you're fine. And actually uh, uh, since there's no operating system when we use the KO25Z uh, you could theoretically uh, have enough nested calls that you could you could push down into your your variables and that would cause a big problem obviously but uh but since there's 8k of memory shouldn't be a problem okay um uh you should you should remember that um uh, all the instructions in the pick are 14 bits and it has a separate program memory from a separate 8-bit data memory which includes the special function registers most of most of whom have 8 bits some of them have a few bits that aren't implemented in the registers uh, but all the RAM has a full 8 bits, of course. Um, so you should know that that there is a that on the 1829 uh, our interrupts are are uh, you don't have uh, you don't have a vector for each different interrupt. All the interrupts go to location four. Uh, on the KL25Z, each interrupt goes to a, a designated location where its interrupt routine is stored. And this is all done through what's called a vector table. Um, you should know that uh, you should know that in in the PIC, uh, uh, we we we, went, we did the sleep lab. So hopefully you learned some things about sleep. Uh, I showed I think in one of the videos that there was less current in sleep. Uh, the way we have the board set up, we've got two linear regulators that are sucking power all the time when you plug in a battery. But uh, but uh, if you if you skip past those and you just look at the power the chip is consuming, the chip is maybe using uh, uh, maybe like uh, 10 or 15 uh, milliamps most of the time. But in sleep, that goes way down. Uh, but uh, so our board's not really optimized for battery operation. Uh, because it it you know it's using a lot of power all the time and if, and you know that once you plug in your battery it's it's driving the two linear regulators all the time that switch is not an on off switch it switches between uh, the power going to the jumper uh, from the 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 CR twenty one hundred two dongle or the uh, the two linear regulators but. As long as the battery's plugged in, it's it's powering the regulators, and it's it's sucking maybe 20 milliamps. It'll run down overnight for sure. Uh, so uh, so um, oh, this is better. Maybe actually this would be better. Let's see. Let me. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm screwing around with this. Try it. No, dang it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, the obviously there's real advantages in having microprocessors with a bunch of on-chip modules. It means you don't have to have a bunch of supporting integrated circuits on the same printed circuit board. That all that function can be done by a single chip. Which makes things smaller, makes things uh, use less power, makes uh, the boards easier to fabricate and populate. There's a lot of advantages. Um, so we there's a bunch of peripherals we didn't get around to using. Uh, we just really scratched the surface. We didn't use a comparator. We didn't use the capture or the or the uh, compare part of the uh, CCP module. Uh, uh, we uh, we didn't use uh, I don't know there's a lot of them we didn't use we didn't use uh, the the, uh, the RS latches we didn't use uh, the uh, uh, the modulator we didn't use I don't know there's a lot of things we haven't used um, so uh, it's nice to have uh, if you're selecting a chip to use in a project there's a lot of things you should think about one of the things you should think about is you want to get familiar with a, a line of chips where there's similar chips with maybe different capabilities so you can go through and select uh, a similar chip that you don't have to start from scratch and learning all over again. 
uh, to do a different project that maybe has a little more memory, has some uh, modules that the other one doesn't have. Like you can find uh, mid-level pick parts that have uh, that have uh, operational amplifiers built in. You can have them with programmable logic on the front end. Uh, you can have them uh, find them with uh, with uh, computing analog to digital uh, modules so that they can uh, read in 10 signals and take an average uh, automatically before the CPU has to even get involved. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, lot of additional things uh, that are available. Um, CAN buses are available. Uh, other things are available on different chips. Uh, so, so it's nice to get familiar with a line, and then you can switch uh, the processors, and but not have to learn to start all over. So that's uh, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, okay, um, when you when you do if you do run a microprocessor on a battery and you're building a mobile app, you really want to think a lot about power because uh, how often you have to charge the batteries is a big deal with mobile devices, and um, so or replace the battery. So it's really nice if you can. Uh, use a lot of sleep so that the processor is not uh, operating all the time and uh, it's also nice if you can uh, if you can either run it directly off the battery power so you don't have to have a regulator involved or in fact if you can um, and the lower voltage you run it at the slower you run it at the lower the lower uh, less power it's going to use um, and if you do need a regulator uh, then you then you should use a switching regulator uh, rather than a linear regulator uh, because the linear regulators always burn power in the regulators but the switching regulator uh, is a lot more efficient maybe 98 percent efficient as opposed to I don't know uh, on a 9 volt battery if you run your chip at 3.3 volts you you're you're only about 30 percent efficient uh, that's pretty bad actually <laughs> um, so um, it's nice to have a lot of uh, capability for different uh, uh, capability for onboard clocks. That makes it a whole lot easier too. Okay. Um, okay. Well, so I'm gonna pick up from here and finish up on Wednesday. Um, and Wednesday I'll do it live and give you a chance to ask questions and all that. All right.